Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, my name is Donna Ayn Davis, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of Women and Society at the Graduate Center. We are absolutely delighted this evening to welcome Jacqueline Woodson for conversation and reading. Um, this is an event that's being sponsored by the Center for Humanities, the Feminist Press, the Gotham Center for New York City, um, the Graduate Center PhD programs in comparative literature and English, the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean, the Graduate Center Library, the Publix Lab, Public Programming <laughs> Graduate Center, Sorry. and Women Writing Women's Lives. And I especially want to thank the center staff, Eileen Liang and Jennifer Bay, who really just make everything possible. Tonight, Jacqueline Woodson is going to read from her book, Another Brooklyn, and then she and I will be in conversation, sort of like a kitchen table talk. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jacqueline Woodson, who is the recipient of a 2020 MacArthur Fellowship, the 2020 Hans Christian Andersen Award, the 2018 Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, and the 2018 Children's Literature Legacy Award. She was between 2018 and 2019, the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and her New York Times bestselling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, won the National Book Award, as well as the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Award, and the NAACP Image Award. She's also written the adult books, Red at the Bone, um, and, uh, Another Brooklyn, which was a 2016 National Book Award finalist. She's written dozens of books for young readers that include Before the Ever After, The Day You Begin, and Harbor Me, um, and Show uh, Feathers, Show Way, and After Tupac, and D. Foster, and the picture book, Each Kindness. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Woodson. Thanks so much and thanks for having me and it's so good to see you and I'm so psyched to be in conversation with you. Um, so I am going to read a couple of sections from another Brooklyn and then we'll chat. Apologies in advance for the dogs if they decide they need to say something about this reading. For a long time my mother wasn't dead yet. Mine could have been a more tragic story. My father could have given in to the bottle or the needle or a woman and left my brother and me to care for ourselves or worse, in the care of the New York City Children's Services where my father said there was seldom a happy ending. But it didn't happen. I know now that what is tragic isn't the moment, it is the memory. If we had had jazz, would we have survived differently? If we had known our story was a blues with the refrain running through it, would we have lifted our heads, said to each other, this is memory, again and again until the living made sense? Where would we be now if we had known there was a melody to our madness? Because even though Sylvia, Angela, Gigi and I came together like a jazz improv, half notes tentatively moving toward one another until the ensemble found its footing and the music felt like it had always been playing. We didn't have jazz to know this was who we were. We had the top 40 music of the 1970s trying to tell our story. It never quite figured us out. The summer I turned 15, my father sent me to a woman he had found through his Nation of Islam brothers, an educated sister, he said, who I could talk to. By then I was barely speaking. Where words had once flowed easily, I was suddenly silent, breath snatched from me, replaced by a melancholy my family couldn't understand. Sister Sonia was a thin woman, her brown face all angles beneath a black hijab. So this is who the therapist became to me, the woman with the hijab, fingers tapered, dark eyes questioning. By then maybe it was too late. <laughs> who hasn't walked through a world, who hasn't walked through a life of small tragedies? Sister Sonia often asked me, as though to understand the depth and the breadth of human suffering would be enough to pull me outside of my own. 
Somehow my brother and I grew up motherless, yet halfway whole. My brother had the faith my father brought him to, and for a long time, I had Sylvia, Angela, and Gigi, the four of us sharing the weight of growing up girl in Brooklyn, as though it was a bag of stones we passed among ourselves, saying, here, help me carry this. In India, the Hindu people burn the dead and spread the ashes on the Ganges. The Coventino people near Bali bury their dead in tree trunks. Our father had asked to be buried. Beside his lowered casket, a hill of dark and light brown dirt waited. We had not stayed to watch it get shoveled on top of him. It was hard not to think of him suddenly waking against the soft, invisible satin, like the hundreds of people who had been buried in deep comas, only to wake beneath the earth in terror. Years erase us. Sylvia sinking back into the dust of the world before I knew her, her baby gone, then her belly, then breast, and finally only the deep gap in my life where she had once been. Angela fading next across the years, just a faint voice on the answering machine when I was home on college break. I only just heard about Gigi, so awful. Were you there? Promises to reconnect when both of us were next in New York. Promises she'd find me again. So much air around the lies distance allowed us to tell as she sank back into the world she had become a part of, a world of dancers and actors, redrawn into royalty without a past. Gigi. Each week, Sister Sonia said, start at the beginning, her dark fingers bending around a small black notebook, pin poised. Many moments passed before I opened my mouth to speak. Each week I began with the words, I was waiting for my mother. The office was small, ivy cascading down from a tiny pot on an otherwise stark windowsill. Maybe it was the ivy that kept me coming back. Every week I spent 40 minutes, my eyes moving from the ivy to Sister Sonia's e-job to her fingers closed around the notebook and pen. Maybe I spoke only because each week I was allowed to look into the brown angled face of a woman and believe again that my mother was coming soon. I know when I get there, my brother and I used to sing, the first thing I'll see is the sun shining golden, shining right down on me. How did I get there to that moment of being asked to start at the beginning? Who had I become? She's coming, I'd say, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. What about your friends, Sister Sonia asked. Where are they now? We're waiting for Gigi, I'd say. Everyone's waiting for Gigi. Sylvia, Angela, Gigi, August. We were four girls together, amazingly beautiful and terrifyingly alone. This is memory. In Eastern, Europe, in Eastern Indonesia, families keep their dead in special rooms in their homes. They're dead, not truly dead, until the family has saved enough money to pay for the funeral. Until then, the dead remain with them, dressed and cared for each morning, taken on trips with the family, hugged daily, loved deeply. That year, every song was telling some part of our story. We crowded around the small radio in Sylvia's room and listened. When Gigi's mother wasn't home, we went there after school, waited while Gigi used the key that hung from her neck to unlock the door. There was no couch in the one room kitchenette. So we sat on the floor around her clothes and play record player. The volume turned down low. We leaned in to listen as Al Green begged us to lay our heads upon his pillow. And Tavares asked us to please remember what they told us to forget. And Minnie Ripperton and Sylvia hit notes so high and long, it felt like the world was ending. The world was ending. We had been girls wobbling around the apartment in Gigi's mother's white go-go boots. And then, and then, and then. Little pieces of Brooklyn began to fall away, revealing us. 
We envied each other's hair, eyes, butts, noses. We traded clothes and shared sandwiches. Some days we laughed until soda sprayed from our noses and hiccups erupted in our chest. When boys called our names, we said, don't even say my name. Don't even put it in your mouth. When they said, you ugly anyway, we knew they were lying. When they hollered conceited, we said, no, convinced. We watched them dip walk away, too young to know how to respond. The four of us together weren't something they understood. They understood girls alone, folding their arms across their breast, praying for invisibility. At eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we knew we were being watched. Sorry, I'm just skipping. <clears throat> we tried to hold on. We played double dutch and jacks. We chased the ice cream truck down the block, waving our change filled fist. We frog jumped over tree stumps, pulled each other into gushing fire hydrants, learned to dance the loose booty to sly in the family stone, hustled to Van McCoy. We bought t-shirts with our names and zodiac signs and iron on letters. But still, as we slipped deeper into 12, our breasts and butts grew, our legs got long, Something about the curve of our lips and the sway of our heads suggested more to strangers than we understood. And then we were heading toward 13, walking our neighborhood as if we owned it. Don't even look at us, we said to the boys, our palms up in front of our faces. Look away, look away, look away. We pretended to believe we could unlock arms and walk the streets alone, but we knew we were lying. There were men inside darkened hallways, around street corners, behind draped windows, waiting to grab us, feel us, unsip their pants and offer us a glance. We had long lost our razor blades and none of us had ever truly stopped chewing on our nails, but still. I and I and I and I, we chanted, we and we and we and we. We hand song down, down, baby, down by the roller coaster, sweet, sweet baby, I'ma never let you go. Because we wanted to believe we were years and years away from sweet, sweet babies. We wanted to believe we would always be connected this way. Sylvia, Gigi, and Angela had moved far past my longest fingernail, all the way up my arm. Years had passed since I had heard my mother's voice. When she showed up again, I'd introduce my friends to her. I'd say, you were wrong, mama. Look at us hugging. Look at us laughing. Look at how we begin and eat end each other. I'd say, can you see this, mama? Can you? I'm going to read one more section. is um, her mother. Her brother Clyde wasn't dead yet. He was sitting at our kitchen table smoking a Pall Mall and telling stories. We knew this because he always smoked. Sorry, just a second. We knew this because he always smoked and we could hear our mother ever so often laughing and saying, oh, you're just telling stories, Clyde, saying, and then what happened? Saying, I'm making catfish tonight. You staying for dinner? My brother and I ran through the fields, the high grass, scratching our legs and feet, the sun beating down on us. This freedom was all we had ever known. Brooklyn was a place my father had come from, a hole closing up beneath him. We only knew Sweet Grove and the words that ended every fairy tale our mother read to us. We lived in our own happily ever after. But after her brother died, my mother began disappearing. First, there was the empty table at the end of the day and me returning home from school to find my baby brother in the yard searching for sugar snaps and berries. No beginnings of meals in the house. My father arriving hours later with bags of groceries, canned soups and pasta, spaghettios and frozen pizzas to be reheated on the top of the wood burning stove. <coughs> Sweet Grove becoming a memory my mother becoming dust. Thank you. I'm gonna stop you. there.
Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Thanks, Donna. Uh, um, so I've read another Brooklyn a couple of times. I just read it again last, <laughs> last night. <laughs> um, and I have, I have some questions for you that were inspired, as I told you, by the questions that Poets and Writers, which is the nation's largest organization serving creative writers, it's the 10 questions that they ask every writer. And so um, it's usually focused on the inside of the story and how a piece is written, but I wanted to elaborate and ask you a range of questions. So I created a series of questions. First is on another Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. The other is on, I guess it's like on Jackie and Jackie's. <laughs> And the third section will be on um, just reading and writing. So um, when I was reading Another Brooklyn last night, I, rem I was struck once again by the, I guess the sort of epilogue, the on writing Another Brooklyn, mm -hmm. at the end where you talk about the process of writing. And I was wondering um, what was the earliest memory that you associated <laughs> with writing the book? I think the, when I'm thinking about it right now in this moment, the earliest memory I have is um, being in Bushwick. And um, <clears throat> when my mom died, we inherited her house in Bushwick and um, she had been a victim of predatory lending. So this house that she had bought for one price was suddenly unaffordable in all these ways and in foreclosure. And I remember going to Bushwick and seeing how much it had changed um, and how it had become this place that was quote unquote cool again. And, mm -hmm. and I, th I think that was when I, and, and I remember um, reading something about someone discovering Bushwick, which of course we, you know, we call gentrification Columbusing, right? Cause people suddenly right. discover right. something. And, and, um, and this Bushwick being this chic place that is the place to go to for restaurant and art and all of this. And I thought about the Lenape, I'm like, you know, we're always, the, the, I'm always very conscious of the people who are here before me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with this element of Columbus thing that happens, people are not. And we were the people that were in that neighborhood before it was that neighborhood that became much whiter, much, you know, to some people's perception, cooler and artsier. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I said to myself, I'm not going to let them erase us. And so that's when I knew I was going to write a book that was going to have an element of nonfiction. So everything about Bushwick in that book is the Bushwick and, and I dedicated to Bushwick in memory um, because the Bushwick that exists did when I was a child does no longer exist. And and, the, and so I remember thinking I wanted, I wanted to write the record of that Bushwick. And, and, um, and then I knew I wanted to write a book that was also poetry. So I wanted to be really intentional about the line breaks and the white space on the page um, mm -hmm. and the words. And, and then I knew I wanted to um, write a narrative, a, a coming of age story about four girls. But so, so it, became, it came to me in layers, but that first memory was about Oh no! I'm not going to let y'all retell this story and erase it. Um, so I know that the book is also you say it that it's about that you wrote it toward hope and longing for the girl's survival. The four mm -hmm. girls that you talk about in the book that you narrate in the book. Um, what did you find anything particularly challenging about them? Because right, sometimes along with like hope and longing for great things also come challenges. Mm -hmm. So did you find anything challenging? Oh, everything was challenging. <laughs> okay. It's interesting because um, I tend to, I tend to be more melancholy as a writer and, and I have to, and that's kind of the first layering of the writing. And then I have to begin to add it, the, the other levels that add the complexity to the narrative that makes it funny, that makes it, um, you know, intellectual that makes it um, um, 
that makes you, makes it stay with you, that makes it resonate. Um, and I think that what I was, um, what I learned from writing for young people is that a book doesn't have to have a happy ending unless, as long as there's hope somewhere in the narrative. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm always trying to center that hope in the story. So even with someone like Gigi, my sense of what happened to Gigi is she flew. Like, you know, and, and people will try to say, no, nah, well, this must have happened to that. I'm like, she flew. This this is my story. This is in my head. This is how that story ends. And someone like August who, um, who ran, you know, basically tried to escape her past. And, but she's always been studying death, right? So it makes perfect sense that she becomes this anthropologist who, who's always looking back in this way. Um, I just, I just found that them being intriguing was enough to help me carry their narratives further into a place of survival. And then with Angela, you know, I was like, she's gonna make it. Like I, I can end this narrative here with her um, disappearing, but that, that there's no hope in that. So where is the hope in that narrative of Angela? The same with Sylvia. We mm -hmm. open and we see her on the subway reading the New York Times, which is, you know, and well-dressed and having aged beautifully. So, you know, she's some kind of professional, right? Um, which is what her dad want, wanted her to be. And also um, this, this, this narrative about someone who gets pregnant as a young person, not being able to do anything but mother. You know, I wanted to show her in a more complicated light. But um, so, so it, was, it was a challenge, I mean, really to, to work with an ensemble cast like that and, and try to give them all stories. I love that reference to, to ensemble cast because that leads me to ask this question about this ensemble cast. Are there any characters in this ensemble cast that you would write about differently now? Than mm. Oh, that's so interesting. I don't think so. I think if I were to write about them differently, it would be a different story. Like I do feel like traces of Sylvia, of course, show up in Red at the Bone, but she's not Sylvia, right? She's she's um, <clears throat> Iris. And I think that, um, I feel like I have, a, with this book, there is closure. I definitely have written books where I've ended up having to write a sequel because I haven't felt closure as an artist. Um, but but with this one, they, they are exactly who I, they landed where I wanted them to land. Okay. And how how long did it take you to write another book? <laughs> it's not, I mean, based on what I've read about mm -hmm. the book, it, it took some time, but... It took some time. It took some time. Um, it, I would say probably about three or four years. I'm, I'm usually working on more than one book at a time. And, and a lot of it was sitting with the narrative and trying to figure out how I was going to pace the story, how I was going to tell it, um, taking out characters that didn't matter to the narrative arc of the story. But mm -hmm. also so much of it was about language. I, everything I write, I read out loud. So if it doesn't sound right, I have to um, you know, rewrite it and reshape it on the page. So I'm not only reshaping the narrative, I'm also reshaping the characters and trying to fill them out. And because it's not a uh, straight you know, beginning, middle and end type narrative, it goes back and forth in time. There's that having to figure out, am I repeating things? Am I leaving too many spaces um, um, unknown? Like are people going to, not gonna be able to figure out stuff? Um, and that that's later on when I start thinking about myself as the reader and the gaps in mm -hmm. the book. Um, so, so it takes a long time and sometimes, and you know, there were points where I just put it aside for, uh, a while to, um, I'm gonna get rid of that toy. Uh, coffee come. I'm, um, I put it aside for a while to just work on something else or, mm -hmm. um, or so I could figure it out and, and, and think about it, but put, I, I took it off stage. <laughs> you know, it wasn't the, the um, primary actor on the stage. It was, it was off stage and it was still in my head, but it was, um, but it was brewing. And I, I think that's true that, you, you know, the story, has to be born, it has to gestate. Like you can't just sit down and write it. Like a part of it, a part of, for me is living with the characters and trying to understand what they want and how they're going to get it. So you just said you are sometimes working on three or four books at a time. Mm -hmm. um, 
is there first of all okay i don't i don't even know how <laughs> but even though you know, as a, i mean i'm an academic so i know people do maybe two or three articles at a time usually on the same topic but oh. three or four books well, keep in mind, I write for different age groups, right? So I can be working on a picture book and a middle grade book and a young adult book and, and an adult book. And, the, and, and I, it's just like changing the channel in my brain because um, the voice is different, the tone is different, the language is different. So it's not like I'm going to get confused by whose story is whose because it's very different people telling the stories in very different ways. And there's rarely, is there rarely any crossover? Like, is there ever a characteristic of a character from one book that ends up in another and I am sure even long before I'm I'm sure people are already talking about the crossover I'm sure people okay. academics are out there talking about you know the the, the overlapping themes and mm-hmm. and you know what inspired what I remember um someone I wrote this book called I hadn't meant to tell you this and and I stay away from um reading people's critiques of my writing and, um, and, but I had read this one and someone had written about I, that the town they were in is Chansey, Ohio. It, and I, and the narrator says chance, but ch- it's spelled C-H-U-N-C-E-Y. And the girl in the story says, but um, chance, chance, Chancy, Chauncey pronounced Chancy wasn't always the place it was. And someone wrote an article about why I chose to name that town Chancy and talk about it as a, I was like, no, that's the name of the town. Like, like I chose Chauncey, Ohio for a reason because it, you know, right. it was a logging town, but it was so interesting. I, I always think it's dangerous to um, really go in on a writer's work while they're still alive because they can come and say, nope, you're wrong, but I, but I don't read it. So go, go, go have at it people. Um, but I'm sure people are talking about the themes. They may be, but. <laughs> um, so when, now I want to ask you a couple of questions about on writing and reading. <clears throat> when, where, and how often do you write? Oh, you t- um, um, BP or, you know, AC before pandemic or after COVID, like it, it, okay. it, <laughs> um, it, BP. Before the pandemic, I, I had more of a schedule, you know, my family, my, uh, my Juliet and the kids were out of the house by 7.30. So the house was mine from 7.30 to like six o'clock. And I would spend a good five, six hours a day trying to get my writing done. Um, mm-hmm. And now in the pandemic, I, I, it does, it's all over the place. So some like tonight I'll stay up late writing and sometimes I stay up as late as two and sleep till 10. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really, I don't beat myself up about it anymore. It's, it's whatever it is. So, but I do try to write for a couple of hours a day or do something writing related just because it's a muscle, you know, and if you don't use it, it's going to atrophy. So I really try to keep myself writing. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of one of my favorite pieces that you've written about is on reading, Mm -hmm. Um, slow reading, which I just I love that piece. I love your TED talk on slow reading. But I don't know that everybody's seen it. So can you talk about, can you tell us about slow reading and what that's done? Uh, I'm so glad you watched that. Thank you. I did a <laughs> TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> I did a TED talk on reading slowly as a kid. And even as an adult, I read slowly. And I it's something that's not allowed and not respected in this way. And, and so I was always being called to te- basically it's about always being called to task for it and realizing that what I was doing was reading like a writer. Mm-hmm. You know, I was reading as an engaged reader. Um, and so often teachers are asking you to read something really quickly and um, and then vomit up the answers to the 10 questions I'm gonna give you about this piece. And I'm always saying, you know, it took writers a long time to read stuff. So, so don't rush through it. And so I, I, I've, I read slowly. I, I, I'm sure um, if I was a kid now, I would probably get diagnosed as dyslexic, 
dys dyslexic or something for the way I read. Um, and, and I just take my time. I go over stuff again and again. I have a lot of stuff memorized because of that. Um, and and I, when a writer does something, I really want to understand how they got me to feel a certain emotion. Um, and so I go back and I read it again until I fully understand. And in the TED talk about, I talk about how writing is, you know, one of our earliest forms of uh, connective technology because it's also a way to connect with people to tell stories. And especially for people of color who are not allowed to read and write, you know, we had the oral tradition as a means of communicating and entertaining and, and getting free. And so for me, both the telling of the story and the reading of the story, it's important to have a very slow um, and relaxed and thoughtful engagement with. Okay. So given that, what are you reading right now? Oh my goodness, what am I reading right now? Um, I, I am reading, I, I just, um, well, Parent Like It Matters, Janice Dias's book about intentional parenting. I'm rereading that because um, I'm going to be in conversation with her. Um, um, Tina McElroy Ansa just sent me a collection of writings that I'm starting to read. Um, and what else is on my desk upstairs? I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm writing screenplays. So I'm, I'm reading um, a lot about writing screenplays and listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm in kind of, I would say, um, a period where I'm not reading as much as I'd like to be, but but I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> um, My fallow period of reading. <laughs> it doesn't sound fallow, actually. <laughs> um, what's the best piece of writing? I'm, I'm sorry, what's the best piece of writing advice that you've gotten? Um, you know, I think it was Catherine Patterson who coined the phrase, Bic, butt and chair you know, get your butt in the chair and write, like, and I, I think that that's the thing. I, I don't, the, the hardest thing about writing is writing, you know, mm -hmm. just sit down and do it and the rest comes. But I think people like to talk about wanting to write or they like to talk about what they would write if they could write. Um, and it's like, just write it. <laughs> just, it, it, it's a cheap hobby, right? You need a pen and some paper and, <laughs> And you know, maybe do voice memos if you can't get that far. But but I I think that it was I know that it's a thing that you have to be intentional about. So button chair is like get intentional, Jackie. Sit down and write. You know, it, you said it's a it is it is a cheap hobby, but it's also like people commit. You commit when you put something on the page, and then there's a further commitment, right? When you have <laughs> other people read it. So um, what stage do you, or is there a stage when you say, oh, I want somebody else to take a look at this? You know, is there somebody like an interlocutor of yours who says, okay, Jackie, this is great, but. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Toshi Regan is the one who reads most of my writing. And, and you know, are we said we, when I'm stuck, we go out to breakfast and she's like, look, <laughs> uh, here's what you're doing. And, um, and she, she has a really good set of eyes and, and she's, you know, so ding dang wise, but, but um, early on, it's me alone doing a lot of it. And, and then when I'm ready, she's one of the earliest people I show it to. And when I show it to people for that first time, basically I say, just tell me what you love about it. That's all I want to hear is everything you love about it. I don't want to hear any questions. I don't want to hear any critiques. I don't want to, you know, I just want to know what you just blow all the smoke so that I can go back and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm onto something. Mm -hmm. And I think because it's so fragile in those early stages, that's real. what's really important. My editor too, who I've been working with on uh, my, um, from with my young people's stuff like the first her first paragraph is always this is a great beginning here's what I'm loving about it like she's she knows mm -hmm. how, how to get me back to the rewrite <laughs> but yeah I, I'm not trying to hear any criticism early on <laughs> I heard that um so uh so you mentioned Toshi who's a, an amazing musician um brilliant I'm wondering um what inspires you in addition to other books? Is it music? Is it art? I know when I have to write, I love going to museums. Oh, really? Yep. Every single time. Even um, <laughs> try to so, 
Mm -hmm. How did you do it during the pandemic? Um, online. Mm. Oh, that's so smart. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had, you know, these go on. Mm -hmm. My music goes on. I have a playlist that changes slightly, but it, it, there's always music in my ear when I'm writing. And, and sometimes, um, sometimes they're just on, like it's part of, it's like kind of like washing your face in the morning. I know when I'm going to write before I sit down to write, my headphones have to be on my ears. It also signals to my family that I'm working and mm -hmm. don't bother me. Um, sometimes they ignore that, but it really, it's, it feels like the uniform for me. So they're always very close by and the playlist is also close by. So, you know, I want to know what's on your playlist. Nah. <laughs> now my playlist is, how do you say, eclectic. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you can find it somewhere, but, you know, it, it's everybody. It's everybody from Joni Mitchell to, you know, James Taylor to mm -hmm. Lil Nas X to, you know, um, Tierra Whack. I mean, it's, it's, it, it spans the gamut. <laughs> Lizzo, they're all there. <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> um, so the more mundane, I don't know if they're mundane questions. They're not about writing. They're just about. Okay. So this is a question that I got from my friend, Greg Tate. He told me that he asked Greg, this question. Greg, yes. <laughs> um, what was your favorite toy growing up? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That is so easy. Is I got, yes. Uh -huh. I had a black Chrissy doll. That's all I'm going to say. I love that Chrissy doll. And for those of y'all who don't know, is this doll and you can make her hair longer or shorter. She had a ponytail coming out of her. That doll was everything. I love that doll so much. <laughs> I might have to go look for her on eBay. She might be corny now, but I love that doll. <laughs> By far my favorite toy. <laughs> um, and what was, I do want to know, what was your favorite book as a growing up did you have one? yeah I, I think the one of the first books I fell in love with was um Eloise Greenfield she come bringing that baby um anything by Eloise Greenfield um what I loved and then I remember falling in love with um, Mildred Taylor's role of Thunder Hear My Cry Louis Dye and um and Beale Street if Bill Street could talk were early on, but I would say Eloise Greenfield when I was very young, along with um, Hans Christian Andersen's um, Little Match Girl, just because it was so sad. Oh, what, that's a great, Hans Christian Andersen. I haven't thought about him in a long time. I know, that's why I was happy when I got the award. I was like, I love his work. <laughs> um, what was a book or a story that was your least favorite? Sounder. I hated that book. I mean, the movie is fire because, you know, Cicely did her thing, but the book is trash. The book is trash. I'm sorry, y'all. The book is, is the story written by a white man about a Black family in the South. They never hug. The only character in the book with a name is the dog. I Don't get me started. And and white teachers were always putting it into brown hands. And, and I, I think it was destructive. I think it, you know, I... I, I feel like I'm here as a writer in spite of that book, <laughs> but I still get mad. I still get mad when I think of that book. But the movie, you know, I guess for what it's worth, I'm glad it exists because if it didn't exist, we wouldn't have gotten that greatest, that great movie mm -hmm. where Cicely did her thing. So um, <clears throat> which author in your opinion deserves wider recognition? Ooh, um, it's so funny because I would say Jessman Ward, but she gets mm -hmm. recognition. Um, you know, it could always be wider. So many of the people who I think are great, their recognition could be wider. I think for so many of the people writing for young and writing books that young people can read, I think adults should be reading those books too. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to say one name because then I'm going to not say 20 okay. others, but, but there are a lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. I just, um, you know, I did the forward for the African look book, um, Catherine McKinley's book, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, it's one of those books that could be a sleeper, but shouldn't be a sleeper because it's about the history of fabric and African fashion and the impact of it on us today. Um, but 
I don't know. There's so many brilliant minds that we tend to um, um, kind of not know they're brilliant. So I'm thinking of, um, what's her name's book? Um, uh, on white supremacy. Um, but uh, she's a uh, um, Middle Eastern author. I'm not going to think of it, but I will. Okay. Me and white supremacy. Like, I think that everyone was talking about um, white fragility. And this is a book, this is a book by a woman of color um, talking about white supremacy that's brilliant, that has the steps to move, um, one can take to move toward anti-racism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a sleep, it, it doesn't get the attention that a book like the other book gets. And I'm just like, I don't understand why. It's beautifully written, it's thoughtful, you know, it's money that can help um, against um, the inequity of uh, the way some people get paid and the way other people don't be, get paid because, you know, once you buy it, you're actually, she actually gets a royalty for it. Mm -hmm. um, and can you, are you looking up her name? Oh man, I hate forgetting her name I, as an author, but ask me another question and I'm going to find her name. <laughs> well, I'm looking it up too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's called uh, me a white supremacy. I can't find it. All right, I'll ask you another question. Um, because I can't find it. That's okay. I will. Oh, me, there it is. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Oh, Layla. Layla Saad. Layla. Yes. Layla. Layla what's her last name? S A A D. Saad. Okay. Okay. Saad. <laughs> yes. Um. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So we only have like uh, three more minutes. So I'm going to ask you the question, which is, so you're working on three or four things. Are you gonna, can you give us any preview? Just uh, like one word in the title, the character? Uh, uh, well, I have, a, I have two picture books coming out next year. One's called The Year We Learned to Fly. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to figure out the title of the other, but it's about Brooklyn in the 70s um, and all the different street games we played. Um, and then I have, um, then I hopefully, hopefully soon will release the fact that, you know, I wrote the screenplay for Red at the Bone and Hillman Grad is doing it, Lena Waste Company. So hopefully that will come to fruition soon. And, um, and then another book I can't talk about cause I'm too early on in it. So, and the adult and an adult nonfiction book that I'm also not gonna talk about. <laughs> okay. I get worried until I'm finished. I feel like I'm gonna jinx it. But once I've written it, I, I feel okay to talk about it. Right. So um, I know we're getting ready to close out, but I, how do you know when you're done? Oh, yeah. that's such a good question. I, you feel it. I mean, what you, I always say, I ask myself, what is this book trying to say, right? And how is it saying it? And when I get to the end, I know that it said it. So there's nothing more to say. And, and I feel like in the line, like um, I'm looking at the last line of another Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I lifted my head to look up into the changing leaves, thinking how at some point we are all headed home. At some point, all of this, everything and everyone became memory. And, you know, it starts off, talk, this is memory talking about, um, the difference between, you know, like what is memory and how do we begin to understand it? And by that last line, when she goes back to Sweet Grove, like they get, you know, she gets it. Um, so I feel like I've answered the question. And I think once you know that question, it's, it's, it's less hard. I won't say easier, but less hard to write toward it. Well, thank you so much, Jackie. I am so excited that you spent time with me tonight. Um, thanks, and I know that if thanks, Jackie. <laughs> and I know that if 300 people could, they would be clapping right now <laughs> here on, and you would be able to hear them. But since we can't hear them, I'm just going to clap and say thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And we hope that you'll come and hear and listen to other um, conversations at the Center for the Study of Women and Society hosts.